So I'm a father of what? I gotta find a babysitter. I found care.com and I was blown away. Through the platform, I was able to find local and experienced candidates along with their reviews and rates, which were way more affordable than I anticipated. Care.com really put me at ease knowing that they were all required to go through a background check. If you're like me and you need to find someone reliable for your child care necessities, check out care.com. Find the ideal sitters for your child care needs. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast. Now, here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Coming off a horrific performance in a 45 to nothing loss at number 17 Iowa State, Kansas State will play its second road Big 12 matchup in as many weeks and the final one of the season when the Wildcats face Baylor on Saturday at McLean Stadium in Waco, Texas. The game kicks off at 6 p.m. and will be shown on ESPN2. K-State is looking to bounce back from three straight losses as the Wildcats enter the weekend with a 4-4 overall record and a 4-3 mark in Big 12 play. True freshman quarterback Will Howard has started each of the last five games following a season-ending injury to senior Skylar Thompson against Texas Tech on October 3rd. With wins in his first two starts at TCU and against Kansas, Howard became the first true freshman signal caller to win to win his first two starts under center. But since, it's been three straight losses at West Virginia, at home against Oklahoma State, and then Saturday's blowout loss to the Cyclones in Ames. Baylor comes off its bye week with a 1-5 overall and Big 12 record. The Bears did not get in a non-conference game after two separate cancellations. BU opened the Dave Aranda era with a 47-14 victory over Kansas, but has dropped five straight since then, including an overtime loss at West Virginia and more recently a 24-23 defeat to Texas Tech on a game-winning field goal as time expired. The Bears are led by senior quarterback Charlie Brewer, who has thrown for nearly 1,300 yards and 11 scores, completing 62% of his passes so far this season. Welcome to the Fitz and Keats PowerCat pregame show. Show brought to you by Robbins Motor Company. K-State is in need of a victory and certainly must play much, much better if the Cats hope to win this game against Baylor because don't be fooled by that record. In all five of those losses, the Bears have been competitive and actually open this game as a favorite to win, according to odds makers. Baylor opened that as a four-point favorite and it has moved up to about five as we near kickoff. K-State fans, visit the Robbins Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat location on Anderson Avenue in Manhattan for an exciting test drive. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the PowerCat pregame show. Kevin Keatsman of Kevin Keatsman Has Issues and a terrific new podcast out of Kansas City will join me shortly as my sidekick through the first half of this podcast. And in the second half, we will have our roundtable session with our Go PowerCat analysts. Ryan Wallace helps out with team coverage at GoPowerCat.com, followed by Brian Hanley, the former Kansas State offensive lineman who played on those historic 97 and 98 teams for the Cats. And then Kelly in Vegas. Kelly Stewart joins us from her home in Vegas, where she serves as an odds maker and analyst for professional and college athletics. I am Tim Fitzgerald of GoPowerCat.com, and we'll take a quick tour of this game and try to get you prepared for Saturday kickoff as somehow this season is nearing its regular season conclusion. Kansas State carries that 4-3 and three Big 12 record with it to Waco, looking to get to that five-win threshold in conference play that it reached last year. Awaiting one week away is another home game, the final game of the 2020 regular season as Texas 
comes to Manhattan on December 5th. But today we're talking about the Bears and the Cats, and the Cats lead this all-time series 9-8 to eight, with eight of the nine wins coming since the Big 12's inception in 1996. But let's get rolling with our preview of K-State and Baylor. And now we welcome in Kevin Keatsman. Mr. Keatsman, uh, how much of that game did you make it through last week? Did you make it all the way to the end, or did you decide, uh, yeah, I have to clean my ears or something more important about halftime? Well, I met a friend to watch at a place. Uh, we were both post-COVID, so we felt pretty safe to go to a place and watch. And so we did, and it didn't take very long before we were looking at our phones and talking about other stuff. It was really disappointing. It was a cool place we were at. They had to come on. There were some K-State fans in there, and most of them left at halftime. We left a little little bit later than that just because we didn't have much of anything else to do. But um, I, I, I thought it was a bad – I know this is terrible, but I thought it was a bad sign that he went for it on fourth and goal at the very beginning of the game. I, I really felt by doing that, and I told my friend at that point, I said, uh, he doesn't think he can beat this team today or he wouldn't be doing this. If it was going to be a typical Kansas State kind of game, I think he kicks the field goal at 7-3, says let's give my defense another chance. Let's see if we can keep this low scoring and close. I think Chris Kleiman knew something about that game maybe the rest of us didn't know. Well, Iowa State was very good. There's no doubt about it. You know, he'd had those – Problems with both Oklahoma State and West Virginia. Go down the field, stall in the near the goal line and kick a field goal and regret it later. So I think he was just determined to put it in the end zone. Yeah. Heck, it's I, first I and goal at the three. <sighs> I'm not disagreeing with the decision, by the way. I would have done the same thing. I, I'm merely saying in this game, I thought it was some sort of an indication that he thought, we're going to have to score a bunch today, that our defense is not holding this outfit yeah. to 20 points or 23 points. It was going to be – we got to get in the 30s today, boys. And I never really liked K-State's chances of that. Well, that was one of the better performance by performances by an Iowa State team I had seen. I mean, that was impressive. Yeah. K-State was bad. Iowa State was good. 45 to nothing. Move on to Baylor. And this Baylor game becomes pretty big for K-State. The Wildcats are still 4-3 and three in the conference, which is notable. Uh, but that three-game losing streak magnifies itself on this game. And the reality of this, Baylor is 1-5, and five, Keats, but in a weird way, this isn't a bad Baylor team. I mean, you go through their record, they thumped Kansas like everyone else is doing. They lost in overtime at West Virginia. They had Oklahoma State postponed, so that's moved back to December 12th. They lost to Texas by 11 in Austin. They lost to T TCU by 10. They lost to Iowa State by seven in Ames and dominated the first half of that game. And then they went to Texas Tech and blew the game and lost 24-23 in their last time out on November 14th. Oh, man, this they're one in five. But Chris Kleiman knows that this Baylor team has got, got some things going on. And what's amazing is they might be ninth in the Big 12 standings, but they're sixth in both offensive and defensive statistics. So they're performing above, above their win-loss record. And that is a big trouble for a team that is right now performing below its win-loss record. How concerned about this game are you? Well, I'm totally concerned, not just because Baylor is better than their record, I'm concerned for Kansas State. It looks like they're off the rails to me. I think there was more than just one loss last week. Um, you know, Baylor's a six-point favorite in this game, so that's all you got to know. Baylor's okay. There's a lot of teams in this league that can beat each other. It's, it's kind of been the theme of our segments this year. Yeah. Every time K-State lines up and plays, we say, well, if they play well and have a good game plan this week, they can beat these guys. But if they don't, they're going to get beat. There's not too many givens in this league unless you're playing Kansas. So that this game definitely fits that category. I just don't have any reason to believe that K-State's going to bounce back now this year. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be a, a pessimist. There's more than just players with COVID. There's more than just players out of the lineup. When you get trounced, like we saw last week, that is rare in this league. That is very rare in this league. And when you see that, something structurally is wrong. And when I read Chris Kleiman's quotes, and you're, you're in the Zoom calls and the news conferences and different things, when he starts talking about outside the program, we have to do better off the field. And I've been around a lot of coaches, and I can't say that I know specifically about Kansas State. He's trying to tell us that his players don't like each other. They've got 
factions of some sort, whether it has to do with, you know, politics or, uh, you know, offense versus defense. That's a very common thing in football. You know, the offensive guys don't get along with the defensive guys. I'm not saying that's happening at K-State. Sometimes it could be along racial lines. In college, it could be along class lines. It could be, you know, the freshmen and the sophomores think they're better recruits than the juniors and the seniors were, and they think they're hot stuff. There's a million things that can go wrong on a football team. I won't tell you I know what it is. When I hear Chris Klein on talking about we got to do better off the field, tells me he's got problems with the structure of his football team, and it's carrying over when they get inside the locker room, when they get to practice, when they're in the facility, that maybe it's a group of players that are either finger-pointing or don't like each other. That's a structural problem. He's going to have to figure that out, and I don't know how you solve that in season. Yeah, you're right. You're right. If if it is that deep, um, it is very difficult to get things unified for whatever's going on. And honestly, we've heard talk all year long that they had some locker room issues with some uh, – you know, different ideas that are going on in there. And and they got over it. They got through it for four games in conference play, and now it's really reared its head. And I think uh, this week really exposed what happened last week and exposed that. <clears throat> um, the biggest problem on the field is Keats' offense sucks. I mean, there's, there's no elegant way to put it. This offense stinks. They've got a freshman quarterback, a freshman running back, a uh, a rehabbing senior tight end who appears to be back to 100% for this game, but they don't have receiver weapons. They don't have enough running back depth. Their offensive line isn't dominating enough. And I'll be intrigued to see if Will Howard starts, which I think he will, but how long is his leash? Do they remove him if he shows signs of playing like he did in Ames and try to give themselves a chance? Because by the time they took him out, Last weekend it was over. Nick Oss was just playing out the string for for him. But if you can't score points, and I don't care what sport this is, you're going to have problems winning. And that's where K-State is right now. The offense isn't very good. Yeah, I don't think Oss is the answer, and I don't know what their plan is down the road. I mean, well, this is this is an interesting topic maybe for the offseason, but I'll, I'll uh, approach the subject today. I assume they want Skylar Thompson back next year, right? And he's yeah. got nowhere else to go. Is that right? I I think so. I mean, I I think, you know, I think Skylar plans to come back. He, you know, this wasn't a satisfying right. end, and it's kind of funny. Early on, when Will Howard won a couple games, people are like, "Okay, let's move on from Skylar." Um, I yeah. I I compare this to the girlfriend breakup. Uh, it felt good for a while. Then after a while you realized, yeah, you know what? She was pretty awesome. I, I kind of miss her. And that's the way fans are with Skyler. They, they now appreciate him much more than they did when he was gone at first because, well, Howard came in, they kept winning and they thought, well, this is the future. Let's just move on now. And now they've realized the future isn't quite as ready as we thought he was. And Skyler coming back might oh. be in the best interest of the team. Well, I, th- I think it absolutely is. And I know a big stud recruits coming in as a true freshman next year, too, who's probably the future for K-State. And it's probably not Will Howard. So we may see a transfer at the quarterback position somewhere here as well. But a, a simple thing like this for Will Howard, just to play out the season, you know, have another off season. I think he needs to gain 15 to 20 pounds. They're going to run him and, you know, pound him into the line twice in a row to try to score a touchdown from the two-yard line in the Big 12. He's got to add some weight. He's got to add some strength. He's got to be able to hit some guys and knock him over if you're going to do that. Skylar Thompson's not the biggest guy in the world, but he's better at getting skinny. He's better at getting sideways and finding those seams when they run the option and trying to score touchdowns. Will Howard's got to learn all that. He he doesn't have a strong arm as Skylar Thompson. He's not as accurate. So to me, it's about getting Skylar Thompson back. And I I don't think some of these problems this team has had this year, I think if Skylar Thompson stayed healthy, I don't think those happen. I think think you get a quarterback vacuum on teams too. You know, if we're – if we're talking about structural problems within the team of guys not getting along and whatnot, a lot of that is you don't have your quarterback. And now an 18-year-old kid has taken the thing over, and there's some 22-year-old guys on defense that don't respect that very much. And, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of issues that have happened with Kansas State. These are not excuses. They're just realities of what the game is. I would take Skylar Thompson back in a heartbeat next year, and I'd let Howard and the kid coming in. Um, I know his dad played in the pros. His name Jake Rubley. Me right yep. now. Jake Rubley. Rubley, yeah, Rubley. I'd bring that kid in and Howard in, and I'd let them compete against each other for the backup spot like crazy. May the best man win. I'm going to guess Rubley has a lot more talent. At least that's what we've heard. We've seen some film. And I'd let them both learn under Skylar Thompson for another year. 
I just don't know how you solve that this year. I don't think Nick Oss is it. I'm sure he's a great kid, but he does not look like, to me anyway, his arm strength and all those. He doesn't even look like a Big 12 quarterback to me. Well, he showed signs of uh, throwing the ball better on time, and that's one of the things Will Howard is struggling with. He doesn't cut the pass loose. He kind of holds on to it too long. Um, maybe he's too worried about those interceptions, and uh, honestly, his receivers aren't good enough to uh, stay open for a prolonged period, so when they have the window when they're open, the ball better be arriving or it's going to get difficult, going to get messy, and it has. It just has. Uh, the line has played okay. They have progressed tremendously. I would really like them to uh, line up with three backs in that inverted triangle, which they haven't hardly shown this year at all. I think they've played a couple snaps of it. And uh, just run the ball. Just try to establish a run any way you can by committing more resources to it and go after Baylor at the point of attack and see if you can get it going. Because it's not just that they're not scoring points, Keats. They're not possessing the ball. They're not picking up first downs. Right. And thus, so you leave right. the defense on the field, you put them in a bad position, and and they start to collapse because they're worn out and the, the other offense gets in a rhythm. And boy, did Iowa State get in a rhythm. Um, yeah, Brock Purdy looked like a Heisman Trophy candidate in that game. I mean, he completed 75% of his passes. And ball was on the money. Uh, running back, yeah, I mean, Brees Hall was incredible. Yeah, that That's not typical of the K-State defense, and that is because the offense stunk so much and the special teams didn't right. do enough. Yeah, it's going to be very intriguing to me. Charlie Brewer is one of those quarterbacks in this conference that I'm not overly impressed with, but what do I know? And Brock Purdy played yeah. an incredible, incredible game. They need some creativity in the pass game at Kansas State, and they just need to really focus and work on that. I know – they want to be a run first team. They want to play action. They want to hit you with big plays. And they've done that this year. Kansas State's offense has generated as many big plays as anybody in the country. When they're not generating a big play, they're doing nothing. It's either incomplete. They run for a one yard loss. There's nothing there. Quarterback gets sacked. It's bad. There's a, there's a play. If you watch the Bucks with Tom Brady, he's, they remind me a little bit of Kansas State in this regard. He tries to go downfield, but that's really not his game anymore. He has to throw it really high in the air because his arm strength is faded. The defenders love it when the ball is just kind of up there in the air. He threw some what-the-heck passes last week. He looked pretty bad. When Brady just gets the snap and throws it to a guy like at the line of scrimmage, they get five or six yards every time. My favorite play in the NFL on first down is you have a slot receiver to the left. You have a wide receiver all the way to the right. You're in the shotgun, okay? Your quarterback gets the snap. Your slot receiver takes a step or two downfield, but it's just largely angling to the sideline. The receiver all the way at the edge just takes off on a jet, just a fly. He's just going straight down the sideline, so that defender is gone. So you're one-on-one -on -one with the guy covering the slot. It's usually a safety's come up. Maybe it's a linebacker. You just throw it. The second the quarterback gets it, you throw it to him. Where he catches it is usually a yard or two past the line of scrimmage. You head to the edge. And if that guy tackles you, you still gain five yards right. on first down. And why Kansas State can't develop that simple play and deploy that to open up their running game is beyond me. That looks like the single easiest throw to make and the single easiest thing in football. And it's almost always guaranteed to get you five yards on first down. And if K-State could just find itself in second and five situations, it would change things dramatically. I don't, I've never even seen them throw that pass this year of you. No, no, they don't. They don't seem to have that controlled passing game. They don't throw many screens. You know, I'd, I'd kill for a bubble screen once in a while out to the receivers. You know, those elongated handoffs is what they essentially are that are passes yeah. uh, are what a lot of these spread offenses thrive on, and those principles work. Those are easy rhythm throws for a quarterback, and getting a young quarterback into that rhythm, into a confident Groove is so important, and we saw the way K-State defended in the past allowed quarterbacks to do that. So many quarterbacks had career days against K-State defense, not because the defense was bad, but they allowed them to feel good. They they complete like five, six throws, easy throws, but now they're in a rhythm. The receivers are loving it. Everything's clicking, and it gets more complex as it goes. That's what they have to do with Will Howard. Find him some easy completions. Get him in a rhythm. Get those receivers going. I've got a couple guys 
Sebastian Taylor's pretty good after the catch with the ball, and he'd be perfect for that kind of play. You know, get him isolated on someone. He's a big kid. Try to tackle me. Good luck. Um, let's yeah. just see what happens here. They're just so thin at receiver. Uh, yeah, it's hard because we watch the Chiefs here, you know, so much, and we see what they do offensively, and it looks so effortless and easy. Um, and so much of this is practice, and it's away from, you know, the legal practice time or whatever. It's about getting quarterback and receivers together in the off season, practicing, doing whatever they can on a high school playground, wherever they can go and work on these things. So much of a passing game is about that sort of stuff. But I'll say something that people aren't going to like hearing. This is in no way, shape or form, any sort of criticism or insult toward Patrick Mahomes, but it is true. Most of what Patrick Mahomes does with the chiefs is pretty simple. Now I'm not talking about the plays that we just go, wow, did he just do that? I'm talking about the offense and I'll prove it to you. Here's how I'll prove it to you. Alex Smith did it, and so did Nick Foles, both in the same offense in Kansas City. 80% of what Patrick Mahomes does out there is pretty darn easy. It's a system. It's a scheme. They know what they're doing. It's controlled passing. It's short. Most things are single reads. It's a play, and here's the play. And if the play doesn't work, what Mahomes does is he throws it away. I don't know if people noticed or not, but he had like 15 incompletions two weeks ago. If the guy that he's supposed to throw it to on the short little pass isn't there, he throws it in the ground. He just gets rid of it. And K-State can do this stuff. I mean, they, they just got to look toward a more creative offense, a shorter passing game. You know, Drew Brees and New Orleans Saints do not throw the ball downfield, period. They just don't. But they've got a great offense. Everything they throw is short. And I, I think that's probably where K-State needs to move in this offseason is Chris Kleiman reevaluates what he's going to do in this conference. I think you can get a controlled passing game that's an extension of your running game. They got a terrific running back. He fits absolutely well into the into a, catching the ball as well. But if you can get a short passing game going, you'll open up the run, and it will change everything for Kansas State offensively. I just I don't think they're very creative that way. No, well, I would agree with you. It, they need to fix something, and unfortunately, I don't know they have time to do it in season. We'll see if they have some pages in that playbook that they can go to. I know Courtney Messingham is getting a lot of criticism for his play calling, and I agree at times it's a little mystifying, but it's hard to call plays when you don't have many weapons. And that's really what K-State's going through on the offensive side. But they've got to find something that works and do it against Baylor. This is not a good Baylor rush defense. Maybe they can get after him, and, and we'll see if uh, if that's possible. I just don't know. They... They're eighth in the conference in run defense. Strangely enough, Kansas State is seventh, but I think K-State's been pretty good outside of facing some really good running backs. Baylor's not good running the ball. I know that. They're 10th. You think K-State's bad? Baylor's worse. You think KU's bad at running the ball? Baylor's worse. So this defense has an opportunity here to really take away the run game from someone and what they are really good at is with the four-man rush, getting after the quarterback. That really is the key for the defense for me is can they get after Charlie Brewer after stopping a run game, any effort to have a run game for Baylor. And if they do, Keats, I like the chances. I think once they get some pressure on a quarterback and bang him around a little bit, we've seen it. We saw it with Oklahoma. We've seen it in other games, TCU that they can get enough pressure with four men to make offenses make mistakes. And let's be blunt, the K-State defense and maybe special teams, possibly both, need to score, period, because the offense can't do yeah. much of it. Yeah, no, well, you're right. The games where that happens, Kansas State tends to win, and where they don't, they don't. I was watching last week. I was looking for 56 all day out there last week. I, now, I didn't watch all the second half, okay, like a lot of people. So I was like, is Hubert playing today? What, what, what the heck? He's just, you know, he's just standing back there tossing easy passes all day. What you described K-State needs to do against Baylor, they've done. As you said, they, they, there's been times this year where you thought that was the strength of the team. You know, look at them stop the run. Who are these defensive linemen? They've plugged in new guys. They're stopping the run. Now it's third and nine, and look at that pass rush. They've done that this year, but it's been gone. Um, it's, it just evaporates at times, and I don't know whether it's blocking schemes. I don't know if it's driven by the opponent. I don't have that answer. I think the big question, and whether it's clear offensively, I don't know. It could be just could be the entire team. I think we'll find out Saturday if K-State's broken or not. Okay, If they right. still have the will to win, if they find a way to pull together this week, if they find it meaningful, and, and the taste of losing is disgusting, I think we'll see that in their effort. 
if they're a team that is broken and they're finger pointing and the blame game's taking place and all kinds of weird stuff's going on, I think they're in real trouble again. I just, I think when bad things happen in a game, those things get magnified and exposed. So I'm going to be curious to see because this is a winnable game. And if you go win it, you might finish with a couple of wins. And what a great season that would be if you pulled that off. I won't rule that out, but I don't think a broken team, and I'm not talking about physically, I just don't think a team that's not pulling in the same direction is going to beat anybody in this league right now. So I think we're going to learn more about that on Saturday. I would uh, 100% agree with all that. It looks like both the starting linebackers will be out again. They were both COVID positive from what we understand. So they're still going to be out, maybe even out for the final game of the season. I'm not sure. They hope to get them back. I mean, you're better with your linebackers. I, you know, I don't care what team you are. you got two starters. <laughs> you want them on the field. Uh, it showed yeah. at times in, in the Iowa State game not 45 points worth. That was a team that fell apart. And you're right. Can they pull themselves together in a very – very winnable game on the road, get the five wins in the conference, which is fantastic. And this year, going at least five and four in the Big 12, I will take it. Not happy about that Arkansas State game, but it happened. Going five and five, okay, but you're right. You win this. You got a good crack at, at Texas coming north in December. We'll see what happens, but are they engaged? And we can X and O all day. But if they're not engaged, it won't make a difference. They're going to get whooped by Baylor. And that would be – Iowa State's good. Baylor is not. And if you get whooped by Baylor, you got big problems, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I do think this is a good year for this. If there is an issue, if there's something structural in the program, this is the best year for it to be oh, outed. Absolutely. Okay, because Chris Kleiman, we can, we can take this year, take a couple of wins, and say this was a goofy year for a lot of people and move on and hit the off season. And he can reevaluate what it is that he needs to do to build this program exactly like he likes. He has all the time in the world. He's got a contract extension. He can do whatever he wants. And, and I'm sure Chris Klein is the first guy to say it. He's not above learning on the job. He's been a head coach for a long time, but I'm sure there are things that he has learned this year that he never thought he'd have to deal with. And maybe you reevaluate that and get ahead of the curve on those things. You're absolutely right. Um, yes, they're losing a lot of players. They've got, Nine guys in the portal right now. They've had 10 depart during the course of the season. Uh, and you know what? Scholarships aren't going to be a concern. They're going to be a shortage in the future. So maybe this will cycle through and they can get some other guys in and, and see if they fit in. Like Joe Klanderman said last week, we're looking for guys that uh, fit what we want to do. And if they don't want to be here, let's get them out of here. And it's been a weird year. So make it happen this year, I guess. Appreciate it, Keats. Yep. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving. You bet. That is Kevin Keatsman of Kevin Keatsman Has Issues. You can check out his podcast on any platform you may choose. And we will be back on the Fitz and Keats Powercat pregame show with all of our analysts. They're lined up as we continue to preview K-State at Baylor, 6 p.m. Saturday night in Waco. The Powercat Podcast will be right back. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562 314 4603 for complete details. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. 
Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or call one 800 522 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov slash gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. We now send it back to the PowerCat Podcast. Welcome back to the PowerCat pregame show sponsored by Robbins Motor Company as we move into the roundtable session with all of our analysts at GoPowerCat.com. At Robbins Motor Company, they strive to earn lifetime business and build relationships selling quality cars, trucks, vans, and SUVs, and offering top-notch parts and service. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the PowerCat pregame show. We're joined now by GoPowerCat's own Ryan Wallace. Boys, last Saturday was a really enjoyable football game, he said sarcastically. Wally, I never saw that coming. Heck, I I predicted K-State would win. I just had confidence they were going to use that magic they always have against Iowa State. But bless Matt Campbell, he exercised some demons on the Wildcats last weekend and really whooped the Cats good. What were your thoughts post-game from that? I think the biggest takeaway for me um, was not as much the offense struggling because, again, we've been talking about it, you know, ad nauseum for the last several weeks about, um, you know, just the the issues that this offense is having, finding playmakers and moving the ball, um, regardless of Briley Moore being back. Um, this was an Iowa State defense that had all the parts. We talked about it in the pregame show a week ago that, you know, this was going to be a physical team that was, you know, really hungry to earn a victory and, and really state their case to be a big 12 championship worthy kind of team. And that's exactly what, what showed up on, on defense for the Cyclones. I think what was surprising to me was the way that K state's defense performed against Iowa state's offense, you know, Brees hall himself, we had some concerns about, I mean, they're one of the best rushing teams in the conference, if not, you know, not the country, but what was really surprising was the way that the defense allowed Brock Purdy to really get in a, in a rhythm. And, and not so much the linebackers, because obviously not having Elijah uh, Sullivan and Justin Hughes makes an enormous difference. Um, but really for me, it was the way that they allowed the passing game to get going for Iowa State. And that wasn't as much to do with the linebackers. I mean, Justin Gardner was back and and he, he played sparingly but had a touchdown thrown on him. It was pretty good coverage, but still didn't see that one coming. You know, didn't see the safeties getting hung out to dry as bad as they were. A.J. Parker was pretty much non-existent, I thought. So that, I think, was the big takeaway for me because since we've been relying on this defense to, you know, be uh, the, the X factor, if you will, for K-State at times, and when you start to see them take a little bit of a slide, you go, oh, boy what's next in these last two games. Yeah, yeah. They started off so good on those first two snaps. I'm like, yeah, they came to play. Brees Hall, two carries, negative two yards. And then it all broke loose. I mean, they started throwing the ball with great success, and Brees Hall got running, averaged more than 10 yards a carry after those first two carries. He only had to carry the ball 15 times, and then they shut him down. I mean, that's how dominant it was. It was just awful. But we come back to the offense. You can't leave your defense on the field that many times. You've got to let them rest. You've got to pick up first downs, let alone score points. 
for heaven's sakes, pick up first downs, not 87 yards after your first drive the rest of the game. That's as pitiful. And Wally, I'm not sure they have any real answers in terms of personnel on offense. They, they're taking away Deuce Vaughn. Defenses are zeroed in and they're scheming for him. Bradley Moore can help. But until Will Howard um, learns to get the ball to his receivers and kind of scatter the ball around the field and be more consistent and throw a better ball, uh, and honestly, they put in some schemes that might work a little bit better in running the ball and get, keeping defenses on their toe on their heels. I don't know how Casey's it's going to score points. This offense is pitiful, and it's become very apparent lately. Yeah, and I I think Will Howard obviously you know his inexperience has has a lot to do with it, and we even saw Nick Ost come in 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 the second half in Ames and. Uh, you know, he's, he had some struggles as well, but at least there was some confidence there. At least you saw him, you know, go through his progressions and put some pop on the ball and, and deliver it where it needed to go. Uh, but again, we've been saying it over and over. The line has been up and down. Um, the, the running game, surprisingly, they've gotten, they have found some ways to get Harry Trotter some holes here and there, but like you said, he's not the dynamic playmaker that Deuce Vaughn is. They've got to get back to, you know, being a more diverse offense and, and getting uh, Deuce Vaughn more flexible, put him in the slot. You know, they've, they've got to get a little bit more creative, but I, I go back to the wide receivers, Spitz, uh, and I, I talked to a couple former Wildcat wide receivers in my direct messages on Twitter during the game last Saturday. And a lot of it does fall on the receivers. They've got to do a better job getting off coverages. Uh, they've got to get back to their technique a little bit more um, beyond what they're asked to do in the assignment. Personally, I think if you go and watch some of the drives, uh, you mentioned that the opening drive against Iowa State, uh, the opening drive I remember against West Virginia was pretty good too. It was shorter routes. You know, it was easy, quick um, don't have to think about it too much assignments for Will Howard, not these big time plays. Uh, these guys that the K state is trotting out there aren't able to do that. They've got to find small intermediate routes that, that can get Will Howard in a rhythm and then open up the big plays to Deuce Vaughn, Keon Mosey, those guys that were working so well in games like, you know, Oklahoma and Texas tech. For whatever reason, you know, Fitz, I'm not a coach, so I don't know. Maybe uh, opponents' defenses are out scheming them where they're taking those things away. I don't know. But to me, it seems like you've got to get a little bit more creative and maybe simplify it a little bit more for the quarterbacks, regardless of who's under center, because they just don't have the playmakers to carry out the big plays. Just a little playing catch out there. You know, pick up five yards. Just. Get that done. I mean, get a little confidence between passer and catcher. You know, the the receivers don't have any confidence in Will Howard, and I don't think Will Howard has any confidence in them. And it shows. It shows all around. Just do some really simple things to get the receivers on track, maybe some bubble screens or whatever. Just get them going. Uh, and I think they'll benefit from it. I don't know. I'd, they've got to solve something on that offensive side of the ball because the formula that they won with, Defense scores. Special teams does something big and dramatic. And then offense scores just enough when we need it. That's how K-State won those games. And now that's gone. It's just not working right now. Uh, but this Baylor team is beatable. But they've been very competitive. That 1-5 and five record is deceptive. If you start scanning down the score list, you see them going to overtime with West Virginia. K-State couldn't do that. They see them leading big at Iowa State in the first half and then only losing by seven to the Cyclones. Okay, State couldn't do that either. So I do get a little worried that maybe Baylor is just laying there waiting for their, their game to break through when they don't blow a lead. Uh, because if they get up, we know this about K-State, they ain't coming back very far. I mean, you get them down by two, three touchdowns uh, with Will Howard at quarterback, they're toast. That's just what it looks like right now. And, and uh Baylor scares me. I'm not sure how you feel about him, but I think this is going to be a tough game. I agree. I mean, this is the most winnable game of the last three or four. Um, but at the same time, it, it makes you a little nervous because you just don't know what the locker room is like right now with K-State. Are they you know, thirsty for blood after the way that they've performed? 
or have they kind of thrown the towel in on what's been, uh, you know, ultimately just a very, very challenging season, regardless of the win loss record with Baylor. Uh, you know, I, I thought on the insiders podcast earlier this week, I don't remember if it was Matt Walters or Travis Tannehill, but th- they said it. I mean, Baylor, regardless of their record still has a ton of athletes and this bears defense is very aggressive. I mean, they will ball hawk to the end and, and they are very, um, good at, at creating turnovers. They forced quite a few against this Iowa State team that looked awfully good against K-State. So uh, K-State's going to have to take care of the ball. I'll be very interested to see you know, who trots out under center because they're going to have to be confident in the throws that they make because, like I said, this is a Baylor defense that is not afraid to just go for it um, and make a jump on a play. And then on offense, you know, I'm a little concerned because on one hand, You've got a Baylor offense that statistically hasn't been great, but R.J. Sneed is one of the best up-and-coming receivers that you've probably never heard about. Um, and the way that the K-State secondary played last week leaves you a little unnerved. And then you've got Charlie Brewer, who, uh, you know, Brock Purdy was able to scramble and extend plays against K-State and kill them against uh, the linebacker play in uh, the quarterback run game. And Charlie Brewer is not going to rack up a ton of yards on K-State, but he's very effective when he needs to be, and he's a senior and a veteran. So he's very good, like I said, at, at extending plays, and even though they are without some some of their backfield mates, you know, I know Tristan Ebner is a guy that opted out midseason that seems to kind of hurt them a little bit. It seems to have kind of given Charlie Brewer some confidence to make some plays happen with his legs, and if you allow this Bears offense to become balanced um, and you don't cut them off at the head and, and take away the running game, uh, you know, I, I really fear that we might see maybe not a, a replay of what happened in Ames, but, you know, maybe a replay of, of what happens uh, happened against uh, Oklahoma State in the second half. You, you have to take away one of the elements that makes Charlie Brewer successful or, you know, he goes from being, what we thought Jarrett Dagey would be to what we saw Jarrett Dagey become against K-State uh, in Morgantown. Thank you, Ryan Wallace. And now it's time for our football analyst, a former Kansas State offensive lineman on the 97 and 98 K-State teams. Brian Hanley joins us on the PowerCat pregame show. Brian, this is a big game for K-State, not just for wins yes. and losses, but kind of for the foundation of what's taken place this season, they have to get back on track. And I just don't know if they have it in them. I guess we'll find out pretty early in this game on Saturday night. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be a, a more difficult game than what I would have thought earlier in the season uh, with the way things are going. And Baylor's had some bad luck. Baylor's not a great football team, but Baylor hangs around and they hang around and they hang around. So, they haven't won a lot, but I still they still have some talent out there. So this is going to be a game where we're going to need to bring our A game if we've got it to be able to win it. Yeah, you're right. They This record is very deceiving for Baylor. As I've mentioned earlier in the show, they, they have been competitive in every game they've lost in the Big 12, including going to Iowa State and emphatically winning the first half. Unfortunately, they lost the second half and lost the game, but only by a touchdown. So that comparison alone to what Kansas State did – at Iowa State might scare people a little bit. And I think this game is about as basic as you could get for Kansas State. Establish the run game. Get some kind of foundation for this offense. And fortunately, you can run on Baylor. And fortunately, right. Baylor can't run the ball very well themselves. The Bears are last in the conference in rushing offense. Take that away and try to get those pass rushers after Charlie Brewer. This is basic football, but I'm telling you, Brian Hanley, if this team isn't mentally checked in all the way, big yeah. trouble will follow. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because just what you said, Baylor's been in every game. And I'm telling you, Baylor has got some football players on that team. You know, I know they haven't won a lot, but just like you said, records can be deceiving. They've got some talent. And if we don't play the way up to our capabilities and do the things that we're able to do that we can do, the game will get away from us. And, you know, and we can't have that. We, we've get, this is a game. I hate using must win, Tim. We, we have to win this football game. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts. We have to win this football game just for the simple fact 
that we've number one, we've got a tough one next week, but we've we got to win this to get the foundation. What you said, this is a game we have to win. You know, if we're gonna do the things that we want to do, especially in the future. We got to be able to win this football game just to, to say that the season hasn't fallen completely off the rails, you know, and to give some guys some confidence. This is a game that we have to win. We just have to. And last Saturday in Ames, Iowa was indeed off the rails. That was a dreadful yeah. performance. But, Brian, if you can't move the ball, if you can't uh, put points on the board, K State moved the ball for one drive. Failed to get points on the board, and that was it. That was it offensively right. for K-State. 87 yards right. after that, it was just awful. Uh, I don't care who's quarterback. I don't care how many weapons you have. At some point, you've got to say, hey, offensive line, and I love your input on this, we have to run the ball, lead the yeah. way. they they got to just be able to move some people, Tim. They haven't done it. It basically in a month, you know, we got to be able to move people and be able to run the ball. And it doesn't matter if they know we're going to run the ball. It doesn't matter if they put eight people in the box, You're still able to count. You're still able to run the football one way or another. We have to be able to do that. Offensive line has just not played well. I mean, they played well early in the season, minus the first game. And they just haven't played well in the last month. And we got to be able to get back to that and playing good football and running the football. Yes, they're going to key in on the run. I understand that. But you know what? The good teams can run the football when you want to run it and when the other team knows you're going to run it. And we have to be able to, to be able to do that because I, we, it doesn't look like that we're going to be able to throw it deep down the field with success. So, Especially right now. So if we're not going to be able to run it and then we can't throw it, it's just what you said. What are we going to do? So, and I don't even care if it, if we're getting four and five yards or three yards and eight yards, that's fine. Let's just do that. But we got to run the football because if we can't run it, it, this is going to be a long game, but you can run on Baylor. It's just what you said. Everybody runs on Baylor. You can do that, but if not, it's going to be tough sled. It sure will be. Baylor is eighth in the conference in rush defense at 171.8 yards. K-State gives up 170.9. So fairly comparable rush defenses, but I think it got skewed a little bit last week but because Brees Hall and that, that running game was so good. But um, you are what your numbers say you are at the end of the day, as coaches like to say. Yeah. And, and right now this team is still above 500 in the Big 12. The numbers say that. If they can focus on what's ahead and not what's behind, this can still be a very successful season for Kansas State football. They are four and three. They have two games that are winnable, and you know they can easily be losses too. Go get those games, and this season will feel like a giant victory. Lose these two games, and the season feels like just a failure. You fell off the end of the table by losing five straight, and you're right. So much for the the future of this program, but uh, I'm I'm telling you, this defense has to come out and play with authority. The offense has got to help them. The offense has got to move the ball and pick up some first downs, even if they're not going to have a scoring drive uh, every That's time. Right. Please possess the ball. Please That's keep right. the defense rested and uh, put them in a better field position. But the defense is going to have to come up big, and honestly, I think they're going to have to score some points. Yeah, special teams, defense. But, again, I'm going to harp on it. The coaches also have to put them in the right positions. Again, just just do what you haven't done. Do some things out of the ordinary. Just, you know, again, I know I say it every single week on what we have to do, and we don't do it, but I'm going to say it again. Run when we think that we're going to throw. Throw when we think that we're going to run. It, it works. And the times that we do those things – it works. We just we don't have the Joes to just line up every down and do you know the norm. So let's just do some things a little bit differently to throw them off to put our guys in the best positions to succeed. Get the offensive line and put them in the best positions where they can move people. Put the quarterback. Put the running back. 
tight end, receivers. Let's put those people in position. That's part of coaching. The coaches have to help too. It can't just be, hey, the players got to to execute. They do, but this is college football, and coaching matters. You, it's football in general, coaching matters, but especially at the college level, you got to help the guys. So the coaches got to help. This is a game that they are going to have to help these guys more than anything. Not that any week is more important than the other, but this is a game, again, like I said, that we have to win. Coaches got to be there this week. They just do. I'm going to put you on the spot. Does K-State win this game? I think they do. It's going to be tight. I think they do. Um, Because of what I just said, I believe the coaches are going to dig deep and understand we haven't done our job the last few weeks. We got to get these guys. I know it's been difficult. I don't want to just put the blame on them, so I apologize. I take that back. We can't just blame it all on them. COVID is crushing us. Player defection, all these things are crushing us. Having said that, it's doing a number on a lot of teams. So, and I know we don't have the numbers that maybe some other teams do, but we got the numbers that Baylor possibly does. So this is a game we just have to go and win, and I think we do win. Well, Brian Hanley, I I think K-State will win this game also. I will predict that. But what do I know? I thought they'd win at Iowa State. I was just a little bit wrong. (laughs) Just a little bit wrong. Iowa State, that was different. I think we were more hoping that we would win than we were sure that they were going to win. This is a game that I think that we know that they can win and should win. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian Hanley. Appreciate it. I will talk to you late on Saturday night. Brother, we got a night game for the first time. We got to stay up late. (laughs) We're old men. We got to stay up late and do a post-game podcast, but we will get it done. We'll make it work. Thank you, Brian Hanley. And now we bring the roundtable to a close with our own Kelly Stewart, K-State's own Kelly Stewart, I should say. As she takes a look at the gambling angle of this game, you know, Kelly, when it came out that Baylor was favored, I was caught a little bit off guard. But after doing some more research, you know, Baylor's record doesn't tell the story of the Bears. They've been competitive in games. They just haven't been able to win a game since beating Kansas. I kind of get it. I kind of understand why Baylor is the favorite in this game, particularly after what K-State did last weekend. What are your thoughts? Well, that's all you have to know, Tim, right, is people bet on what they saw last. They do it in college football. They do it in college basketball. They do it in the NFL and basically anything that you can bet on. What did I see? What are my eyes telling me? My eyes are telling me K-State sucks. They just lost 45 to nothing in an absolute embarrassment in Ames. Well, what happened the week prior to that? Well, they were on a bye. And Baylor lost at Texas Tech. The week prior to that, what happened? Baylor was very competitive at Iowa State, and K-State dropped one at home to Oklahoma State. So I think that's where the line's coming into play. Look, it's too high. It should be three, maybe two and a half, if uh, I'm not giving Baylor any home field advantage, which, by the way, I do still give a little home field advantage, even though we know it's essentially worth nothing without a crowd there. There is some familiarity, and right. I, that's where I disagree with some of these other guys. Look, these kids have played in their stadium. They've been on that field. And, yes, K-State gets to play there once every two years, so there's some familiarity there as well, but not to the same extent. So that's why we're seeing a line that's five. Uh, I'm all over K-State in this one. I do think that they have a bounce-back look. The Wildcats have had their ups and downs all season. They have had moments of greatness, those moments of greatness, beating now, which is a really good Oklahoma team, being able to take it wire to wire um, with TCU and be able to pull out the win, beating the absolute crap out of KU. This K-State team has just shown that they're not that disciplined because they're unable to put complete games together week after week, right? Like starting at the very beginning of the season, losing to Arkansas State, and then turning right around and impressing everyone, right? I, I think sometimes younger, undisciplined teams let big wins go to their head, and they're a great fade the next week. K State probably is pretty down on themselves after that uh, that beatdown, and I, I expect a very good showing from them this week. Well, I hope you're right. I, I hope K State has within itself enough to bounce back, particularly on the offensive side of the football that was so bad and hasn't been very good the last three weeks. They need to find something that works. But the good news is they've gone against three really good defenses. And as of now, Baylor is not a good defense. They do give up plenty in the running game. This is an area that K State maybe can move the ball and, and get something done. And 
Baylor's really one dimensional. They get the worst running game in the off in the Big Twelve, and they kind of rely on the throw. And Charlie Brewer hasn't been as consistent as he needs to be. This is an intriguing game. K State really, really needs this game to get back on the winning ways, get the five wins in the conference, and to head into Texas with a little momentum. It's going to be, um, it's going to be interesting to see how the Wildcats respond because last week stunk. It was awful. You know, it's sad because I didn't watch a second of the game, and then by the oh. time I actually had the opportunity to, I knew it was oh. too late to even get involved. It was a good life choice you made right there, not watching that. Um, <laughs> Iowa State at Texas. This is the big one. Texas is a one-point favorite. Um, this is going to sort out probably a spot in the Big 12 championship, particularly if Iowa State wins. Um I'm a little surprised Texas is favored. I think Iowa State is really starting to play some good football. I like the clones a lot in this game. Yeah, it depends on where you shop, Tim. I'm seeing Texas one. I've seen Iowa State one mm. throughout this week. So it really just depends. And, and let's be honest, they can't tie. So a pick em situation here doesn't really matter. So the bounce back over zero doesn't necessarily say a lot. If we were to see one of these teams go to like two, two and a half, you know, that's sharp money moving the market. I don't think the wise guys, as far as a Vegas perspective, want to get involved in the side. I truly do think this is a coin flip. And that's why the line reflects it. Personally, I like the under here. I did some videos with some of the guys over at Wade talk yesterday and we got to talking about this game and i'm going wait a minute pump the brakes i i think a lot of people expected on paper for this to be a high fair i think this is going to be a knockout drug out just one of those hard fought games kind of one of those 28 21 type games you know 24 23 something in there where people are really shocked at the, at the final score and uh under 56 and a half is really high yeah, I mean that's it's going to be interesting. I I'm uh, eager to watch a game. It kicks at uh, 11 a.m. on ABC on Friday, so that'll be a nice game to have your uh, post Turkey Day uh, Big 12 game there with Iowa State and Texas. Of course, Kansas State and Baylor are at uh, six o'clock down in Waco, also on Saturday. Tech and Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State is 11-point favorite at home. That game is 11 a.m. on Fox on Saturday. I think Oklahoma State's going to roll. I I know they've been struggling a little bit, but I think they'll get going against Tech. I mean, in theory, they should, right? Right. Uh, This is the Oklahoma State team that I said last week on Twitter when people were asking me, what do you think about Bedlam? I said, look, I, I would love to take the dog against Bedlam, and they just got absolutely smoked. So I I think the narrative here is going to be tack off a bye. You know, the week prior to that, they were able to get get the win over Baylor. I think it's going to look like Texas Tech is the trendy underdog here. I think Oklahoma State is the play, and uh, I wouldn't bet this under with anybody else's money because we know that Tech's defense loves to give up the long ball, and they will score points and match their opponent as well. But, yeah, I lean towards Oklahoma State here in the over. I would agree. TCU is at Kansas, and, uh, you know, TCU has not been impressive this year. They are now 3-4 and four in the Big 12. They've, they've got a little bit more head of steam. But they haven't been an offensive juggernaut. And I know Kansas is bad, but when I saw 24, 24 and a half is what I'm looking at right now for a road favorite in TCU, I was a little – that that says all you need to know about what the odds makers think of Kansas right now. Kansas is total trash, and trying to balance out the money is difficult because everyone will want to – bet against K. And you're absolutely right. Of course they will. Last week they were supposed to play Texas. It got postponed. Uh, the week prior, they had a bye. The week prior, they got the crap beat out of them by Oklahoma. The week prior, they couldn't even get in range of Oklahoma State and then luckily hit the back door with Puka Williams, who's no longer there. Look, you're right. This is going to be really tough for the bookmakers to get some money on KU. But... Here I am going, okay, when is KU going to mess around and put a Big 12 team on upset alert, right? They do it once every year, sometimes twice. We've seen it with Texas in the past. We've seen it with Oklahoma uh, State, excuse me. And I wouldn't be surprised to see something crazy here just because they haven't played. They're fully healthy. Surely they've been practicing. And then here's a CCU team you just mentioned. They got off a of, off of buy and then a, a ugly loss to West Virginia. I mean – this is a lot of points 
to be laying with TCU, who I think could win this game. Let's just say something very agreed and low scoring, like 21, 10, oh. right. And in no way were they ever going to cover that 24. That's this type of game to me. Now I haven't gotten involved, but I will be keeping an eye on it because you're right. This is going to be all TCU money. This may go to 24 and a half. This may go to 25. And if it doesn't, and all of those tickets are on TCU and that line doesn't budge at all, you know that the bookmakers are holding their steady position on KU, and KU should cover that game. Well, it'll be interesting. And unfortunately, looks like Oklahoma and West Virginia has been postponed. I had totally missed that. I'm so upset. I gave that out as my best college bet this week. I was in love with West Virginia plus 11. All signs pointed towards West Virginia playing tough, getting the cover, possibly an out, uh, an outside shot at winning the game. It is what it is. Yep. Oh, it is 2020, and that's what we're going through right now. Just as long as K-State can get this in and get in next week with Texas, I will be absolutely astonished that they got all 10 games in without uh, you know, rescheduling. It's been remarkable for the Wildcats. They've come close, man. They probably would have been better off with the reschedule last week. <laughs> uh, but uh, I admire Chris Kleiman. If he has the numbers, he wants to go play. he much rather and play think- than not. I think that makes the most sense. I think it says a lot about coach. I'm excited to have him as our head coach. I think he's done the best that he can do in this season. And and it makes me proud to be a Wildcat. Yep. I I agree 100%. Well, thank you, Kelly Stewart. I appreciate it very much. And with that, the round table is closed and we bring this power cap pregame show to a conclusion. That was Kelly Stewart preceded by Brian Hanley, Ryan Wallace, and Kevin Keatsman as we have previewed from beginning to end Baylor and Kansas State. They meet Saturday night in Waco. The game will be shown on ESPN2. Kansas State carries a 4 and 4 mark with a 4 and 3 record in the Big 12 into the game against the 1 and 5 Bears which did not get in a non-conference game, but buyer beware, the Bears are the favorite. I'm Tim Fitzgerald. Brian Hanley and I will be back Saturday night with the post-game podcast as we recap the Wildcats and Bears. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. It's the UEFA Champions League on Paramount+. Plus. Europe's top club soccer tournament. Champions versus champions. The best teams facing off in the knockout rounds. Magnificent! And it all takes place. While you're filling out financial reports at work. In the middle of your day. In the middle of your week. So use that second screen. Call in sick. Do whatever you gotta do to tune in Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Nobody watches the UEFA Champions League like us. Knockout rounds begin February 13th on CBS and stream live on Paramount+. Plus.